Cinema Awardee and the co-director and co-producer of the film, Marco Williams. So I'll start things off here and give people a minute to think. Uh, one of the most obvious questions is, how did you come to the subject? How did you come to this uh, film? Um, so Stanley Nelson, um, some of you may know his work, uh, uh, one of our great documentarians in the United States of America, uh, and his company Firelight Media uh, have been working towards a trilogy of films that Stanley uh, wanted to do a, like an America Revisited. And the three films were to be, or are going to be, Black Panthers, The Vanguard and the Revolution. This was the second, and he has just raised half of the money to do a four-hour series on the African slave trade. So this is oddly, even though this is kind of perceived, you know, this would be the middle chapter, well, it is the middle chapter. He started with The Panthers, and then this, so it was very much always there for Firelight to wish to tell this story, and, and my involvement, uh, typical, I've known Stanley for a lot of years, and I uh, had taken a, uh, a flight to New Orleans from New York four or five years ago, and there was a whole series in the Delta Magazine about black colleges, so I had seen Stanley and I said, you know, I really want to make this film about uh, HBCUs, and he said, we're already doing it. I said, well, maybe we should do it together, and he said, well, I'll let you know, and so that, that, that's how I got involved. So, did you have personal experience, personal attachments to these? <laughs> yeah, I went to the Howard of the North, uh, Harvard University, so I, had, <laughs> I, 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 I myself uh, did not have any direct uh, relationship. So in, in that way, it was a very rewarding, personally, to uh, receive what I did not receive in my own uh, college education. I think here in St. Louis we have uh, uh, Harris Stowe University. There may be some Harris Stowe people yeah, here tonight. I saw, yeah, I saw a few earlier as well. And there's actually a really good alumni network, I think, for various, for various uh, HBCUs. You might also be here. So uh, there might be some good questions for people who have uh, their own personal experiences. So uh, I'll open it up to the audience. Any questions for Marco? While you're thinking, no pressure. <laughs> Uh, I just I should let you know. So the the film will be broadcast on PBS in February 2018. I think it might be the second Monday I think of February. So at the very least, uh, please uh, you know let people know that way. And also, if you you know we're doing a lot of screenings on campuses and the like. If you're interested, please contact Firelight Media. As a, as a way to uh, see if you can bring the, the, the film to your campus, uh, to a high school, etc. So when you dove into this project, did you have any preconceived notions that changed one of the things that surprised you through the process about HBCUs? I, I won't say that preconceived notions, but I think what was uh, affirmed for us in making the film is how much and how essential uh, black colleges and universities have been to the shaping of America. And that's what we try to do in the film. I think you know, one of the more obvious uh, moments is, is uh, Brown v. Board of Ed. That, as uh, Jonathan Holloway says, um, it couldn't have happened at a white college. That it had to happen at a black university, the seeds of dismantling racial segregation. And I think that that's what we really valued and appreciated throughout the making of the film is that how often young black men and women on college campuses were change agents, agitating for change, sometimes tragically as in Southern University, other times heroically as in Brown v. Board of Ed. And sometimes, uh, you know, with some unclear consequence or result. Looking at Morris Brown today is one example of, of a, one of the oldest in, uh, black colleges that was formed by the AMA, um, and it's barely uh, in existence. And so it's not a simple and easy story. It's complex. There are currently 105 HBCUs, so 
they're at once this one big family and at the same time very diverse, each representing different things. So that's what I would really say to you is that we were, we, I think each of us working on the film found again and again and again uh, an affirmation of our contribution to this country and the world. Oh, I think I see questions there, and then I'll go to you, right in front of I actually did attend the HBCU. I went to Lincoln University. Um, I work with students, so I'm consistently telling them about the benefits that I've had about attending a black university. But other than that, just on an individual level, what would you say that we could do to ensure that our institutions aren't dying out like more? So I don't know if everybody heard the question, the, the, the woman who, uh, who stood up and, and shared that she went to Lincoln University, which is one of the first, uh, if not the first, HBCU in the country, and there's been some you know, debate, but Lincoln University, very, very important. Uh, Thurgood Marshall went there, Mike Hughes went there, just to name two of our uh, um, important alumni. She's asked me, and, uh, what could we do to keep them vibrant, is that a fair paraphrase? I, I don't know, but I think this is the, you know, I, I very much wrestle with this, and I'm not, we didn't fully get it into the film, but I, I really wrestle with this, that the that Brown versus Board of Education was like a pyrrhic victory for us. As um, Walter Allen, the sociologist says, that as a result of Brown v. Board, and as we know that, it changed our communities. So, uh, desegregation changed our communities. Black people could go to white doctors, white dentists, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I always felt that that was an important kind of chapter that we don't quite have in the film, that uh, what can we do? But the, the young people at the end of the film give you some sense of what can be done. Um, Mary Schmidt Campbell, the current president of, of, of Spelman, conveys a, a possibility. That, that those who know about these institutions and know what each of them has to offer, has to advocate for what that institution has to offer, just in the way that uh, predominantly white institutions advocate for what they have. And I think that you know, perhaps these institutions have not done as well in that regard. And in fact, the vast majority do not have a very strong alumni network. When we were uh, doing research, we contact schools and say, do you have, and they say, well, we've got a lot of stuff in the basement. They didn't have archives. They don't have archival. Um, so it's really like incumbent upon all of us to be contributing. Just as, you know, so like if Harvard has 300 billion or whatever it is, uh, endowment, how do, you, how, how do these institutions get endowments? Because that's really, you know, at the end of the day, it is, it is about resource. Um, and so what, all the institutions have is human resource. The alumni who went there, who, who know about it, who pass it down to the next generation. Right here. Um, I'm wondering, do you feel that the reasons for the existence of black colleges and the reasons for attending um, historically black colleges today are they the same reasons as in the past? Are they different reasons in some way? Um, in a way, it seems to like empowering the individual was kind of an overall, um, an overall good reason for them. Is is there any different reason today that you see for the school, same schools, or is it basically the same? I think if I understand your question, is that you know. Are the reasons for attending an HBCU the same today as they were at their origins, if you will? And you then noted and observed that the film emphasizes at least one theme of empowerment. And I think in your question, you have, you have identified an important answer. There is empowerment. It's even said by one of the young people. Uh, no, it's actually said by one of, and I don't remember the, the, the uh, it's, uh, sorry, I can't remember his name at the moment, but he points out that this, for, that it is a place, if you attend an HBCU, where you're not looking left or right at somebody who's of a different race, who may have already had a privilege, or there's a, a bias associated with they being smarter, or more of this, more of that, in the same way that 
women's colleges, like why women go to Smith College in the East Coast. Because that's a place where if you go, when everybody's like you, like you and there's no inherent bias there, you already are empowered and a sense of value and worth. And so, you know, I and look, I'm not a, I'm not the right advocate. There are there are people in the room who have attended who could probably answer far better than me since I did not go to one of these schools. But I think that that is at least a reason. And, I, and if I if I may, and I really uh, uh, this is it's, it's important to be pointed because that question could be asked this way: Is there a reason to go to a predominantly white institution? And I think that's as important as asking why should one go to an HBCU. We, we never consider why go to a PWI, That's right? right. That's right. They, they just are, they are better, they are da da da, they are Harvard, they are Yale, they are UCLA, they are, you, you, you name it, the University of Chicago as though because they are that, they are better, but we, we fail to assign the fact that they are PWIs. They are predominantly white institutions. I hope that gives some flavor. Let's see, we'll go. Uh, oh, the woman in the, the red had her hand up. Please. She had her hand up before I did. Okay. Um, I read just recently that um, enrollment in Iowa HBCU grad Lincoln University. Um, in the I house. Read recently that um, uh, in the article implied that it was a response to our current political uh, climate and a response to like the Black Lives Matter movement, that there has been a resurgence in interest in going to HBCU that many have seen just in the last few years increase. So that kind of speaks to, partially to your question, that as a black person, um, can you find the same kind of empowerment as a white as school? And for some, maybe yes, for some, no, but one can make the argument that the racism has not gone away. The uh, inequality has not gone away. So if that was a reason to go then, there would be an equal reason to go now. Thank you. And I, I did not know this, uh, that, you know, and it's not surprising that perhaps the pendulum swing would, would occur a little bit, even in the face of, you know, I mean, there, there, there are, there have been a uh, Briar College, I believe it's called, but a predominantly white institution closed. I mean, it's not that only black institutions are closing. There are some white institutions. It's hard to be at a, a, a university these days. Yes, I wanted to uh, venture to give a shout out to my mom. She's probably the oldest HBCU graduate here tonight from Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, and she's now from 65 I want you to know that I tried very hard to get Lincoln in. I apologize to you that it's not front and center. If I had known so many people from Lincoln would be here, I would have been sure over and over and over again. But I had another additional question. I just, I, I went to the Ivy League of the Midwest and the Ivy League of the East. I went to Northwestern and Cornell. And um, my question is this, have you considered, I went to a P PWI but we were at HBCU still. And if any of you all have gone to PWIs, there's still an HBCU type of entity that's there. You eat together, you dance together, you study together, etc. So when I went to my reunion, which was my 35th reunion just recently, same thing. There was this group of white students, our alums, and there were the white white students. So have you considered doing a documentary regarding the, the HBCU within the PWI. I, I, like, I like that idea, you know. So, so I, Harvard, as I've shared that that's where I went to college, they, they have, I think it's like been every five years, they just do a black alumni weekend. They don't even bother with the, the, the regular reunions. They make sure that we, we get to the you know. So, so it's an interesting idea. If you don't mind, I'm gonna, I, I, I have this little pocket in my pants where I put all things that I don't want to lose, so I'm going to put that idea right in here. Okay? I got you. There's a young man way in the back. That's you. Can you speak on HBCUs compared to 
the 21st century to the 20th century? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 you know, <laughs> why did I call on this guy? It's always, it's always the youngest ones that that that, that stump you. Um, yeah, I, I think there's, you know, you watch the film, so I, I, I would I would highlight this. So certainly in the beginnings, as as our film sh shows, there are a number of institutions that made a real emphasis on what was referred to as industrial education. Uh, an education where blacks were being taught how to be a carpenter or a maid or a cook or that sort of thing. And as the century has passed from one century to the other, the education has changed and a, a greater emphasis on, and a complete emphasis on what we would call liberal arts education. Uh, you know, I, I would like to say, so things that people don't realize, and I'm not sure if this is fully accurate, but I hope this gives an answer. There, there is a one HBCU that produces more PhD candidates than any other college in the university, in the, in the United States. That's Spelman College. More PhD candidates than any other college. Now, if you don't know, Spelman College is a woman's college. So that means there are more black women going into PhD from Spelman. So that's just something to give you one thought. For the longest time, um, Mahari, no, Xavier in New Orleans, more black dentists. So I'm giving you perhaps a reason why these institutions are important. So I don't have a full answer for you, young man, but I hope that you have a, an appreciation that, that these are some of the values of these institutions. Okay. I'm Marianne Dunlap, and I'm the director of the Monty Rites of Passage program. And this is Michael Franklin, who is one of the mentors from the Rites of Passage, my daughter Darn you. <laughs> from Hampton University, I'm from Lincoln University. <laughs> we have five boys here with us this evening who just, <laughs> they, they just returned from an HBC uh, tour uh, in Atlanta and Morehouse, um, with Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, and Tuskegee. That was their second HBC tour. Last summer they went to Hampton and Howard. Stand up, boys. We're, we're, uh, <laughs> fifth and sixth graders. We're planning the seats early because we want to do this before peer pressure gets, uh, gets uh, uh, in the way with them. So I just wanted to introduce them to you, and we'd like to take a picture possibly after you. <laughs> you certainly may, because not only that, I was sitting behind these young men, and in the first film, when Lonnie starts to sing, these young brothers started to, they're the ones who became the chorus in the, in the film. And I want to say thank you. You made, you made that, you. the screening of that film for me, one of the best screenings I've had. I never had a call and response from the audience. Uh, but I see Lonnie next, he's going to be delighted. So I want to say thank you for that. Creates a need to rise. I think it's very beautiful. Look, 
just to, if I make a comment on that, and I think it, you know it's it's on us, right? I mean, HB, you know, it's on HBCUs, each individual one, to do the kind of recruiting that they might need to do, developing their alumni networks. I mean, they're great alumni networks on Facebook for different institutions. So that's obviously social media is one aspect. It's on us for women like that to take young people now to begin to see. It's on us in terms of our schools to make sure the guidance counselors know about these institutions and don't, as that uh, young woman from the West said when she told her friend she was gonna go to some place and they said, why aren't you going to UCF, you know? We need to make sure that people know that, okay, UCF, that's cool, but you know, BAM is cool too, you know? And so that's on us. Look, I, I, all I can say is that I, 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 I think that history has demonstrated that Brown has had a profound impact on our nation. And prof you know, profundity is about change. And change is not neat and fluid, it's complicated. It's, I'd say, more often than not for the best. Uh, but yeah, you know, look, I, I mean, I'm from, so look, I've been in Chicago. Uh, I've been in this town. I made a film called MLK Boulevard, the Con MLK Boulevard, the Concrete Dream, and I went down St. Louis's MLK Boulevard, and it's just you know gone, right? Uh, and so some of that is that there was a time, bef maybe before desegregation, where you could probably go up and down that, and there would be the cleaners, the dentists, the doctors, all black, black owned, and black people were going there. Now we have choices just like everybody else has choices. Are choices bad? No, but what, what could we be doing? And so I, 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 I would not want to be living in a segregated time like that. I wouldn't want to be living in an explicit Jim Crow. We may still be in a kind of Jim Crow, but I wouldn't want to be living in that kind of time. I, I like the, the, the choices and the opportunities that I have, so I don't think that it's a, if, if it's a step back, we then took two steps forward at the very least. But that's that's just me speaking. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. I think you did a great job on the film. I'd like to know what this, how can I get a copy? Uh, yeah. uh, I, I, I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go on the web, if you go on, um, what is the, the link? You gotta go on, if you go on firelightmedia.org, Firelight media.org, there should be a link for now how to purchase the film. I think there we, we, we have a, um, you know, like a, you know, get one early kind of promo, you know, so that's that's the best way to, to, to access it. I didn't bring a box of DVDs with me, so sorry about that. I just one question about the first film. Like, you know, yeah. This is just my thing. Yeah. I thought this film would have been much more uh, effective if there was a message if there had been some history done on that category because that category is not history. Look, you're absolutely right. Let me just say this. You know, I, I wanted to make a film that was different than that, and that's what you see. Is that I, I think there are a lot of those kinds of films that look to kind of provide an overarching context or what I would say explanation, which I think are very important. And I, I met Lonnie when I was teaching at the University of North Carolina, and he, he came as an artist in resident or residence, and I just followed him for 10 days. And, and, I, and I just thought, okay, I might be able to make a film that gives you some feel for the man and, and, and not simply the art, because you're right. The, and, and I should say, if you want to know more about the work of Bonnie Holly and other artists, you should go to the Souls Grown Deep Foundation by a man named William Arnett, who is kind of the foremost collector of what might be called vernacular or outsider art, but we'll just call it art made by African Americans that have been not really recognizing. And in fact, Arnett is now giving away, giving it away, he's not giving it to me or you or you guys, he's giving it to museums and the like. 
And you're absolutely right. That, that would have been a fabulous film, but I just wanted this little glimpse of Monty, the man, and I had hoped that, and I even, I just want to say this, I wasn't even sure I wanted to have much bio of him either, because I just, what I wanted to make a film about was the creative process, and how Lonnie inspires you to create, and how he makes you see beauty everywhere. And, and, and yet, that little bit of the, that interview with him was important in the end, because he says, they call us lazy, da 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 We know who the they is, and you know who he's talking about. And it's, it's exact, what Ronnie demonstrates is that he lived at a time, he's still alive, but he grew up at a time where in Alabama, he's from Birmingham, to be black, and if he had started painting beautiful pictures with paint and crayons and that sort of thing, he would have been abused, punished, you know. And so, and I said this is the last screening, Ronnie in many ways is subversive. He said, all right, you, you, think I, you think I'm lazy, da da da, stupid, da da da, and I'm just gonna create. And then, look at that boy, he's just making stuff out of trash garbage, but his stuff is now in the museums. So, you know, so that's all I can say. I wanna say, I think that's it. So, hey, look, everybody, this was really fabulous for me. Uh, for, on both accounts, it's so much fun to show Tell Them We Are Rising uh, because it's, uh, it's got, highs and lows and when I, you know, audiences laugh at the right time. And it's just really a, a real pleasure and of course it's always a pleasure when there are people who have attended HBCUs because then it's like a home movie. And like, you know, we're just at home and you're watching something together. So I want to thank all y'all who came out for that. And I also want to thank you all for your response to Bonnie Holly, the truth of dirt. You laughed at good moments. You were surprised at the right moments. When he finds that dirt on the floor and everybody thinks he's crazy, and then boom, it's a work of art. So don't be inspired by him, be inspired by the HBCUs. Thank you. If you don't know, we're doing free screenings here all weekend long. Uh, and a lot of it's through the Mean Streets program. There's actually a flyer out there for it. So if you're interested in more free films, grab one on the way up. We hope to see you uh, back here tomorrow. Thank you.